Hi guys, this is Steve Moss, pastor at Boulevard Christian Church. God's mission for us here at Boulevard is really simple. We help people find Jesus and we help people follow Jesus. And our teaching team hopes that this message that you're about to listen to will help you learn to grow and trust Him more than before. If it does, would you consider giving a gift to Boulevard to help us carry out the mission that God has given us? Thanks. We hope your heart is fully open to what God has for you in this message today. Good morning. It is really good to be with you all here this morning. Uh, the last four months of our lives have been kind of crazy. Uh, this is something that happens over the period of 20 years. And having to use the, the glasses up here, so I'm going to be playing with them a lot. Hope that doesn't distract you. But it is really good to be here uh, with you guys. Uh, we've been down as often as we can be over the past four months just to kind of share in times of worship and Sunday school classes and things with you all. And uh, so that's been really good. Uh, but I will say it has been uh, a very, very busy time. Um, as Steve said, we just returned from 20 years overseas. And so um, we're transitioning to life here uh, not here in Muskogee, but actually Webb City, Missouri. Um, but we're transitioning to life back in the States, and at the same time, we're also transitioning to life as empty nesters. Um, our daughter, our youngest, is uh, a freshman at Ozark Christian College, and so all the kids are out of the house, and so it's all kind of new territory for us in a lot of ways. Um, since we've been back, I wrote this down, uh, we've been in Florida, Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, Michigan, Colorado, Texas, and California. So we've kind of been from East Coast to West Coast, we've been all over the place, and I didn't even uh, mention the states that we went through to get to those other states. And so you can see that we've been doing a lot of traveling, and we've been doing that because we wanted to say thank you family and friends, uh, visits that we had, but also we visited a lot of our supporters. And um, just to thank them for the 20 years of support that they gave us in our ministry in Turkey. And so first things first this morning, Sean and I would like to thank you. We've said thank you a, a number of times over the years, and it just doesn't ever feel like enough, to be quite honest with you. Um, Boulevard has been a very faithful family to us for a long, long time. From the very beginning, when we didn't know where we were going or what we were doing, we just knew we were supposed to do something. And we came forward, and we asked for prayer, and you guys were faithful to pray for us. And it didn't stop there. It just continued. Um, your support to us has been incredible. And so I just want to Thank you. Thank you for the encouraging notes and letters, and thank you for the financial support, and thank you for sending teams, and thank you for continuing to be a support to us as we transition to life back here. Um, yeah, you've just been an awesome family to us. So we know it's, it's not us. It's a, it's a team effort, guys, and... Um, God sent us, but God gave us you, and so we're thankful for you. Anyway, since being back, uh, one of the things that Sean and I have really enjoyed doing is sitting down in evenings and watching this television show called Alone. Are you familiar with this show? Alone, it's, it's basically a show where they send 10 people out into the wilderness with almost nothing, and these people have to figure out how to survive on their own in sometimes very incredibly difficult conditions. So they have to figure out a way to build a shelter. They have to find food. Sometimes they're faced with danger from uh, wild animals. Sometimes it's extreme weather. So I don't know if you're into this sort of thing. I, I myself, I do like um, outdoorsy stuff, but I don't think I'd ever wanna try doing this. Um, but it's interesting to watch and it's interesting to see what these people do to survive, the things that they make, the things that they sometimes eat. Um, I don't know if you're a fan of the show, 
my wife often has to turn her head and say, tell me when this part's over because of the things that these people are putting in their mouth for sustenance. Anyway, we've watched through seven seasons of this show now. Sometimes we binge watch a little bit. But uh, we've watched through seven seasons, and I've noticed something interesting. Almost every contestant on this show underestimates the difficulty of the challenge. Now, none of them are new to it. None of them are new to this kind of thing. They've all had survival training. They've all done things like this before, and supposedly they're experts in the field of survival. But almost all of them are guilty of underestimating the difficulty of the challenge. Each of the participants is interviewed before they go out, and they all kind of say the same thing. They all kind of feel, feel like because of their training, uh, because of their past accomplishments, because of their survival skills, because of their physical, emotional, and mental strength, that they have what it takes to get them through to the victory, basically outlast everybody else. But then they're dropped off. And sometimes it's a day, sometimes it's two days, sometimes a little more, and all of a sudden they're all begging for mercy. One guy in one of the seasons that we watch, he was a big burly ex-Marine. And you know, to see him you would think, yeah, this guy has what it takes. He'd faced a lot of things in his military career. He lasted three hours. I think he set the record. Three hours he was out there and he was calling saying, come get me, I wanna go home, okay? What had happened apparently is he said he'd seen a bear. Now what's funny about this is that a lot of people see bears, but what's funny about this is they interviewed him before the show, uh, before he ever went out, and they said, what are you gonna do if you encounter a bear? And he said, well, I feel sorry for a bear that encounters me. <laughs> and yet, he sees this bear and he says, no, it's, it's time to go. Three hours. So what does this have to do with Ephesians? What does this have to do with spiritual warfare? What does this have to do with Paul's teaching and his encouragement to us? Let me read the first few verses in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, starting at verse 10. Let me read the first few verses of our passage. I'll give you a second to turn there. Ephesians 6 starting in verse 10, and see if I can uh, tie this together for you. Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Well, right away when we read this, what do we see? We see this is a warning, okay? There's no doubt about it. When we read these first few verses, we realize Paul's transitioning and, and telling the Ephesian people and telling us as well that, hey, you're in a battle. This is a warning. Do not underestimate the circumstance that you're going into. See, we don't want to be like these people on this show alone who go out there and feel like, oh, I've got everything I need and I'm going to do just fine. Paul says, no, you need to make sure you understand this is no joke. This Christian life that we're in, it's a battle. And so right off, Paul says, we need to recognize in a battle, we need to recognize who our enemy is. Guys, Satan is very real. And he is not to be taken lightly. Tomorrow night, in cities all around the United States, small towns, there are going to be little boys and girls running around with costumes on, collecting candy. And some of these boys and girls are actually going to be dressed like the devil. They're going to wear little red suits, and they're going to have horns, and they're going to be carrying pitchforks and have pointy tails and all those things that we think of when we think of Satan and how he must look. And it's going to be innocent, and it's going to be maybe even, some people might say, cute. But I want you to listen to what Scripture tells us about Satan. 
In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, your enemy Satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So his desire is to destroy. In 1 John 3, 8, it says, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Then later, in John 8, 44, it says, Satan was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. So he's like a lion looking for someone to devour. There's no truth in him. He's been lying from the beginning. He's been sinning from the beginning. In that same passage in John chapter 8, it also says that when Satan lies, he speaks his native tongue. For he is a liar and the father of lies. I want to stop here for just a minute. I want to talk about this idea. Because Sean and I were in Turkey for 20 years. And in 20 years, uh, we learned a lot of language. We learned a lot of the Turkish language. I feel like we did a pretty good job. Uh, always felt like there was more we could learn. But we did a pretty good job, and we were able to converse with people. And we spoke Turkish every day. But I'll tell you, if we had to be in a conversation with somebody that lasted a, a longer period of time, a half hour, an hour, it was exhausting. Even after 20 years, even after all the classes and all the things that we'd learned, okay, it was exhausting. And Sean will tell you the same thing. It's tiring. Your brain gets tired. You physically get tired. You just want to go take a nap after you spend a long time speaking to someone in Turkish. Why? Because it wasn't our native language. English is easy. See, when we speak English, it's just like, it just flows. I mean, I don't have to think about I, it just comes, right? And I don't have to think about what you're saying, and I don't really have to think that much about what I'm saying. We just talk, and it just comes out. It's just natural. And that's really what John is saying here when he's talking about that lying is his native tongue. He's talking about the fact that for Satan, deceit is just that easy. It just flows. He doesn't have to work at it, guys. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul tells us that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. A couple of the world's biggest, fastest growing false religions exist because of people who had a visit from an angel. Revelation 12, 9 calls Satan the deceiver of the whole world. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 refers to Satan as the god of this world, and it tells us that he has blinded, not the eyes, but the minds of of the unbelievers. And Hebrews 2.14 tells us that he has the power of death. You get the picture. See, he's not innocent, and he's not cute. He's very, he's very, very real, and his goal is to destroy us. We can't underestimate our enemy. All throughout the New Testament, the Christian life is compared to a race or a contest or a battle. And yes, the Christian life is the best life we can live because we were created to live that life, but that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Jesus, when he called his disciples, what did he tell them? He said, count the cost. If you're going to follow me, you need to count the cost. And Paul says, everyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. See, so when we become followers of Jesus, it's, it's game on. We're entering a battlefield. And it's good for us to recognize who our enemy is. We also need to recognize who the enemy is not. In the text, Paul simply says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So when we think of our enemies, what do we think of? Because most often we probably think of people or we think of groups of people, or we think of governments, or we think of man-made systems that kind of rise up and against us and against the things that we love. That's what we think of as our enemy. But Paul's quick to point out, it's not the people. The enemy you have isn't anything you can see or touch. It's nothing in the physical world. Recently, I heard a story of a, a young couple who had been on the mission field They'd been serving in a country where they were trying to reach Muslims. And 
They had returned to the States. They were having dinner with some friends, and they were sitting across the table from them eating dinner, and they looked out the window, and they noticed that the neighbors looked like Muslim people. The woman had a head covering. They looked like a Muslim family that lived next door. And so they asked, they said, are your neighbors Muslim? And this is the answer that came back to them from the host. They said, yeah, our neighbors are Muslim. But we prayed the gays out of that house, and we're going to pray the Muslims out of that house too. Guys, the gays and the Muslims and any other classification of people that you can think of, they are not the enemy. They're not the enemy. As a matter of fact, they've been deceived by the enemy. They're victims of the enemy. These are people that we need to be reaching out to and love and showing them the gospel and giving them the hope that we have. So as Christians, we're in a battle. But it's not against people. It is against a very real and formidable opponent. One whose goal is to destroy us. So the next question is, how do we engage in battle with an enemy that's so powerful, so deceitful, an enemy that we can't even see? Let's go back to our text. Picking up in verse 13. It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. So Paul gives us here kind of a list of things. If we're going to engage in battle with this enemy, with our real enemy, real warfare, he gives us a list of things that we're to do. Now, this isn't just a list of things where we can go and pick and choose. It's not a potluck, right? It's not like, oh, I can try to do this, and if that doesn't work, I'll try something else. Because he says, put on the full armor of God. He says, basically, guys, you're going to need everything, every piece. And then he gives us this list of things that we're to do. As we think about this, I think it's important to understand that, guys, when God calls us to do something, he equips us for that thing. He gives us exactly what we need to be able to do what we do. God called Sean and I to go overseas and do life there, and we can't take credit for it. He equipped us for doing that. Part of that equipping us was through you, as I've already mentioned. And I know it's already been mentioned in this sermon series a couple of different times. Guys, when God says, I want you to do this, he's then going to provide a way for that to happen. And so the first thing that Paul mentions is truth. He says, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Now with each of these elements, Paul likens them to a piece of armor on a soldier, probably a Roman soldier. And this is to give us a picture or an illustration. And so for truth, he uses the illustration of the belt. Why? Because the belt was essentially a foundational piece for all of the other pieces of armor. It was the one thing that really tied everything together, held it all together. Things were hanging from it and tied to it. So the belt was the foundation, not so much unlike what we use the belt for now, right? To hold everything together, hopefully. So what's Paul saying here? He's saying, have truth as your belt. Have truth as as your foundation for everything else. Truth needs to be the foundation. And we live in a world where relativism runs rampant. If you're not familiar with that term relativism, I'm sure you are. uh, If you're not familiar with it, I'm sure you are familiar with the effects that it has on society. Basically, relativism says there are no absolute truths. Everything is relative. 
And this thinking goes against all uh, the laws of logic by saying that something can be true and not true at the same time. And so you have people saying things like, well, that might be true for you, but it doesn't mean it's true for everybody else. Or it might be true for you, but it doesn't mean that it's true for me. See, with relativistic thinking, everyone's responsible for providing their own version of the truth. And all points of view are equally valid. Now, if I'm going to be honest, I have to say, there are times when relativism works. There's times when it makes sense, okay? And that's in matters of taste. That's kind of the limits for relativism. For example, I might say to you, uh, chocolate is the best flavor of ice cream, okay? And I might be making a truth statement about myself when I say chocolate is the best flavor of ice cream, but I'm not necessarily making a truth statement for you, okay? You might think vanilla or strawberry, okay? Actually, I kind of think vanilla. But anyway, you get my point. Or I could say the Denver Broncos are the best football team. Again, might be true for me, probably not true for most of you. Or I could say something like country music is better than rock and roll. <laughs> might be true for some of you, absolutely not true for me. So in matters of taste, this kind of relativistic thinking where we all come up with our own version of the truth. It works in matters of taste. But what about other questions? Bigger questions. Questions like, is there a God? Guys, there either is or there isn't. Right? And if there is a God, what's he like? Are people valuable? Are they more valuable than other things in the world? If people are value, valuable, where does their value come from? Is there a moral standard? Is there absolute right and wrong? Or is it just totally arbitrary and totally up to you? See, when you remove truth, anything goes. And the result ultimately is chaos. Several years ago, I had a student in a philosophy class that I taught at the school there in Ankara. And we were having a conversation about this very thing, about whether or not there is absolute truth. And of course, I was on the side that was saying, yes, there is. You have to have absolute truth. Otherwise, you have chaos. And he was on the, of the opinion that, no, it just kind of depends on where you're from and what your background is and what your culture is. And so the argument wasn't going the way I wanted it to. And so... We left it, and I had that student in another class later in the day in a PE class. And I thought, this is my opportunity. I'm going to teach him a little bit of a lesson. And so he came out dressed for PE, and I was standing there. I was talking with a few other guys, and I saw him, and I said, hey, John Lorenzo, go run two laps around the court. And he didn't know why I was telling him to run, but he's like, okay, coach. And so he went, and he ran his two laps around the court, and then he came back to me and stood there with the group, and I said, what are you doing? I said, I told you to run two laps. He said, I did. I did. I went around, and then I went around again. I said, well, that might be what two means to you, but that's not what it means to me. See, everything's relative. Two for you means going around and going around again, but two for me, you just better keep going. I'll tell you when you get to two for me, okay? So, I sent him out and had him start running again. And I think as he made those laps, he was kind of thinking, I think probably absolute truth is a thing. I think, yeah, I think there is such a thing as absolute truth. So Paul's encouragement here is that we have truth, this truth, as the foundation for everything else. We need to be committed to knowing what the truth is. We need to be committed to living our lives based on this truth, to dealing with one another based on these truths. It sounds pretty obvious, but unfortunately we have Christian schools and colleges that are teaching our people, our young people, that we really don't know how much of this is actually true. And I, I, said, I said that correctly. We have Christian schools. My son attends one. 
where he has professors that say, now we really don't know how much of it is actually true. Consequently, there are students that he talks to that walk out of those classes and they say things like, sorry, I used to believe, I used to believe that the Bible was inerrant, that I could trust it, but now I'm not so sure anymore. Hmm. There's probably more we could say, but we need to move on. The point is, is that we need to have truth, this truth as the foundation for everything else. The second thing that Paul says is that we need to have our breastplate in place, the breastplate of righteousness in place. Now, the breastplate is obviously an important piece of armor. Why? Because it would protect vital organs. It would be like chain mail or hammered metal that would cover the chest and it protect vital or organs, namely the heart. But what is the righteousness to which Paul's referring? See, I think righteousness can kind of be seen in a couple of different ways. They're actually interconnected, but you can think about righteousness in a couple of different ways. One would be right standing having the right standing for God, before God or being in right relationship with God. But this isn't our righteousness that accomplishes this. We know this is Christ's righteousness that he gives to us in that process of salvation. When we give him our sin, he gives us his righteousness. So he gives us that right standing. The other one is righteousness can be seen of as right living or living in obedience to God. And so scholars, as I read about this, they had different ideas. Is this talking about Christ's righteousness or is this talking about us being righteous and living righteous lives? And I think probably it's both. Why can't it be both? See, we're protected first and foremost because Jesus gave us right standing before God, before God the Father. And secondly, because the Holy Spirit works a transformation in our lives and we go through this process of sanctification and we start to live righteous lives. Both of these things act as protection for our hearts. If you skip back in Ephesians, back to chapter 4, I know you've already covered this, but there's a verse here that speaks to this. It says in Ephesians 4, verse 22, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires and to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And so we put on this breastplate of righteousness that protects our heart and it's first by accepting the righteousness that Jesus has for us so that we have the right relationship and then secondly, through the work of the Holy Spirit, we're transformed. And we begin to live obedient lives. The third thing Paul mentions is have your feet fitted with readiness that comes from the gospel. I like the way it says it in the New Living Translation. It's worded this way. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. See, a soldier's shoes were important both offensively and defensively. Defensively, the scholars tell us they had cleats on the bottom of their shoes or spikes on the bottom of their shoes in order to be able to dig in and stand firm against anything that might be coming at them, not be moved. And so in that sense, Paul's encouragement here is that we stand firm in what? The truth of the gospel, the gospel of peace. Another way we could say it is we need to be confident with regard to our new identity in Christ. We need to be confident with regard to the fact that the old is now gone and that we've been made new. I have a question. I just want you to think about this. You don't have to answer out loud. This is a question I like to ask my students in my Bible classes back in Turkey. Are you a sinner? How do you see yourself? Are you a sinner that's saved by grace? Or are you a saint that still struggles with sin? How do you see yourself? Are you a sinner saved by grace? Or are you a saint that still struggles with sin? The answer is probably both, right? 
yeah, I, I'm a sinner who's saved by grace, but yeah, then also I'm a saint. But think about it. I hear so many people say, well, Christians are just sinners saved by grace. And what's the focus of that statement? The focus is on that past life of sin. See, but when you think of yourself as a saint that still struggles with sin, that, that, that's something that seems to gel with the rest of the New Testament, right? Because once the work is done, okay, once the gospel has taken effect in our lives, we become something new. Yeah, we're sinners saved by grace, but we're so much more than that, right? We're a holy priesthood. We've been made righteous. We've been made pure, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. As James talked about back when he was talking about chapter 2, we are God's workmanship. And the Greek word behind that word is this word for poem. We're God's poem. That's who we are. Do you see the difference? Okay, because if you think of yourself just, oh, I'm a sinner saved by grace, you're only getting half of the picture. You're so much more than that now. And I think that's what Paul wants to tell us when he says we need to have feet fitted with the gospel of peace. He's saying, stand firm with regard to who you are in Christ. You are a new creation. And so the shoes are defensive, helping us to stand firm, but they're also offensive. Because God's desire isn't that we just stand on the truth of the gospel, but his desire is that we take that gospel up and we take it to other people, right? Paul says, be ready, in season, out of season, be ready. Everybody here has points of contact, people who don't know. Be ready. The next thing that we're told is to take up the shield of faith. The purpose of the shield for the soldier is actually pretty obvious. Paul says that our faith shield is used to extinguish Satan's arrows, his flaming arrows. But before we talk about what faith does, I think we should discuss what faith is. I want to take just a second to define it. Because we use this word a lot, faith, and we throw it around and people mean different things when they say it. What is biblical faith? Well, I'll tell you what it's not. Faith is not blind. Faith is not believing without evidence. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, faith is just believing even though you don't have any evidence. No, it's not. God's not going to call us to do something and not provide. He's not going to call us to believe something and not provide reason for us to believe it. Okay? Faith is not divorce your mind. Faith is not with devoid of reason, right? So faith isn't just wishful thinking. My favorite definition of faith, the one that I share with my students, actually comes straight out of the dictionary, and it says this. Faith is confident belief in the truth, value, and trustworthiness of a person, thing, or idea. Confident belief in the truth, value, and trustworthiness of a person, thing, or idea. I like that because it gels pretty well with what the writer of Hebrews tells us because the key word in that definition is that word confident. It's confident belief. And the writer of Hebrews tells us that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Guys, how can we have confident, sure, certain belief if there's no evidence? We can't, right? Right? And there's evidence all around us. There's plenty of evidence for our faith. Psalm 19 reminds us, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. What's the psalmist saying? He's saying we look at what God has done and we know. We can have confident belief because we see what he's done. Yeah, we can't see him, but we can see the results of his work. And not just in creation, we can see the results of his work in our own lives. 
we can see the results of his work throughout history. Okay? So faith is confident belief. By the way, in Romans 1, Paul explains that creation, creation alone leaves men without excuse. See, in other words, we can't look at what God has made and not have faith. So in short, if you're lacking faith, maybe you haven't looked at all the evidence. So how is faith like a shield? Well, I think this is pretty obvious because faith is basically a protective barrier between us and Satan's attacks. When we believe God, and we take him at his word, then we remain grounded in the truth, and the lies of the enemy, they lose their power, they lose their appeal. So faith becomes for us a shield to extinguish those lies that come in the form of flaming arrows. The fifth element that Paul mentions is the helmet of salvation. Again, I think the importance of a helmet for a soldier is pretty obvious. The helmet protects the head and therefore the brain, which is the command center for the rest of the body, right? So what's Paul saying when he says that uh, salvation is like a helmet? Paul, essentially, he's telling us to recognize that because of the power of the cross, salvation, our enemy Satan no longer has a hold on us. And salvation isn't something that we just look forward to but it's also something that we live in day by day because we have this assurance. And with the the, the assurance of salvation that we have, we have confidence then to move forward in obedience. This is how Paul's able to say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He could say that because he knew his future was certain. And so that's what enabled him to continue to trust God in the here and in the now. Think about it this way. If you know the future, if you know what your future holds, you can handle the day-to-day difficulties. In 2 Corinthians 4, it says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The last thing that Paul mentions is the sword of the Spirit, which he tells us is the Word of God. Now, this isn't the only time in Scripture that we see God's Word compared to a sword. In Hebrews 4.12, we're told that Uh, The word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. In Revelation 1.16, John's vision of Jesus, he sees Jesus with this sword protruding out of his mouth. Paul's encouragement here is simply this. We need to use God's word to confront and combat Satan's lies, Satan's deceit. Probably the best example that we can point to is Matthew chapter 4. We don't need to read it. You know the story. Jesus is led into the wilderness for a time of testing, right? The the Spirit leads him into the wilderness. He fasts for 40 days, and then Satan comes three different times. And three different times, what does he use to repel those attacks? God's Word, all three times, and Satan walks away. So Paul's encouragement to us is to do the same thing, to take the truths that are found in Scripture and use those truths as kind of a lens through which we view the world so that we can recognize. And right now, guys, the world is throwing a lot of stuff at us. You don't have to be overseas serving in another country to have uh, Satan use the world to throw different things at you. It happens right here. And so we need to have his word as the lens through which we filter all of that. The catch is, you got to know what it says, right? The psalmist says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's a lot of stuff. I know. It's not going to be easy to remember all of that. It's a good thing it's written down for us. So we have the belt of truth, which is having truth as the foundation for everything else. We have the breastplate of righteousness. This is both Christ's righteousness and our ability to have 
a righteous life, to live in accordance with God's directives. We have feet that are fitted with the gospel. Being confident of who we are in Christ because of the gospel. Guys, we're so much more than sinners saved by grace. We have the shield of faith. Having confident belief that's based on evidence, based on experiencing God, based on what we see throughout history. And this confident belief extinguishes the lies of Satan. We have the helmet of salvation. Having assurance about the future, which enables us to live for God in the here and in the now. And finally, we have the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And having His Word as the lens through which we view the world, we can combat the enemy. I know it's a lot, but I have one more thing. Because at the end of this passage, Paul highlights the importance of prayer. It's almost as if he's saying, all of this armor of God stuff, it's totally dependent on relationship. It's totally dependent on prayer. He says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Just keep praying. Keep the lines of communication open. Stay in contact with the one who's given you all these things and provides you with the strength to accomplish what he's called you to do. Keep those lines of communications open. Keep praying. It doesn't say it in the passage, but I kind of wonder if prayer isn't the real key. Because if I can maintain that constant communication with my Heavenly Father, I think all this stuff just kind of happens more naturally. I more naturally have His truth as my foundation. I more naturally have a confident faith, confident belief in what He is and what He's doing. And I more naturally use His Word as a filter through which I see everything around me. I think prayer might just be the key to all of it. We have an awesome Heavenly Father. He calls us to work alongside Him and He gives us exactly what we need to be able to do what He's called us to do. And He doesn't just give us what we need, but like I said, the key is the relationship, right? So He's right there with us. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank You so much for your word for the truth that you've given to us so that we can make sense out of who you are and what we're here to do we know it's not going to be easy we thank you God that you have uh, provided uh, yeah just opportunity to work alongside you and you've given us exactly what we need to be able to do the battle that you want us to do. And mostly we thank you for just the fact that you're always with us, that you're here with us now, you hear what we pray, and you're on our side. And ultimately we know because of that, we have victory. Pray these things in Jesus' name.